right, top of the morning everyone. This is Scott Lobdell and this is a quick tutorial video about how you can pragmatically go about merging sensor inputs, in particular between a GPS and an accelerometer. So, I'll go ahead and just write these down. If I have an accelerometer and I have a GPS, then what we're going to do is we're going to take these inputs and we're going to output predicted positions. And the value of this is twofold. One is that I can get predicted positions at a dramatically higher frequency than I would otherwise be able to get with a raw GPS signal. And then the other advantage is that using uh, the accelerometer, I can get much better GPS readings. So your GPS readings are going to be uh, on average accurate, but otherwise there's a standard deviation associated with your GPS. And so you can use the accelerometer to sort of correct all of those values. Um, so let me just talk briefly touch on these uh, sensors a bit more. So your accelerometer by itself is also going to be fairly useless in the context of predicting positions. So for example, if I give you a raw acceleration, so from you know some time period to some other time period, this is my acceleration, and I ask you what was my final position, you wouldn't be able to tell me because you don't know what my initial position was, you don't know what my initial velocity was. So if I can merge those with a GPS, then I can give you uh, a sort of accurate estimate of where my new position is going to be. Uh, so that's sort of step one. The, the step two is just sort of how these sensors actually complement each other. So a GPS is going to be low frequency and low accuracy. but uh, the values are relative to some absolute position. And then your accelerometer is actually the opposite. That's going to be high frequency and high accuracy, but it's going to be subject to drift. And what that means is that over time, it's going to accumulate error. So even the smallest amount of error is going to accumulate. And then after you know even several seconds, your predictive position is going to be way far off from the actual uh, real position. And so to go about doing this, we're going to end up using a Kalman filter. Um, and then the purpose of this video is not to explain what a Kalman filter is or even to explain it well because I think a lot of other resources already do that and they already do it better than I would be able to. So the point of this is just to say, how can I go about implementing a Kalman filter, uh, which I had trouble with and I had to spend a lot of time researching and understanding. And so this is what this video is meant to do and distill. So if I have a Kalman filter, then I have sort of two input steps. There's predict and update. And your prediction means I'm going to input, uh, in this case, my accelerometer. And I'm going to use that to predict my position. And then the update is going to be my actual GPS. And that's going to give me, a, that's going to sort of uh, take me back to a position that's close to reality if my prediction step is off. Um, so that outputs your predicted position. So that's sort of what, what the API of a Kalman filter would look like. Uh, to actually set this up, to actually define this in code now, um, there's a whole bunch of variables associated with the Kalman filter. And these are actually pretty overwhelming. But the point is, if you can just understand your use case and understand how to define those variables, then the, the actual implementation is to literally just follow the formula. So if you can go online, you can find a formula for a Kalman filter, and if you can just define what the variables are, then you're pretty much good to go. So that's sort of the piece that you need to understand. And so uh, there are a number of variables in a Kalman filter. I'm only going to go over the ones that you need to define. A lot of the other variables are just uh, der or are calculated from your inputs. And so here's, here's essentially what you need to define. You have a number of these. You've got A, B, U, Q, R, uh, and Z. Okay, so those are the, if we define all of these, then we can do our implementation. So uh, A is going to be your state transition matrix. And what this will do is it will define uh, what your system will look like absent any inputs. So in the position and acceler acceleration example, or not even acceleration yet, just position and velocity, uh, which by the way, that's, that's what our common filter is maintaining. It's uh, 
position and velocity in our case. That's what we're estimating. Okay, so if I told you that I'm in space and there's no wind resistance and I'm at some position at some time and I have some velocity at some time, then with a state transition matrix, you will know that given uh, over the course of several seconds or whatever, I can predict exactly what my new position and my new velocity is going to be. Okay, and then B, continuing on with our definitions here, B is going to be your control matrix. So in my little space example, this means that this is going to define, given new inputs to the system, how is that going to uh, affect position and velocity. Uh, and the, your input in this case is U, which uh, we'll, we'll call that the control vector. So to bring this full circle, your control vector is acceleration, in this example. Your control matrix is what we multiply the acceleration by. And I'll, I'll go into this in better detail later. Uh, Q and R are both very similar. This is your, your variance, your covariance matrix for your two inputs. So Q maps to acceleration, R max, maps to GPS in this case. So uh, this is your process variance. And this is your measurement variance. So these are both covariance matrices that will end up looking something like this. Uh, you know, if you have a two by two matrix, it's going to be your your variance, variance diagonally, and then zeros the rest of the way. And so the way you can get this, so for example, if I just take an accelerometer and I put it on the ground and I just leave it at rest and I measure a bunch of samples and I can compute what the standard deviation of those is. And if I square the standard deviation, then I can come up with a covariance matrix. Um, same with your uh, measurement variance. You do the exact same thing. But it should be noted, you can't, what I just described, you can't actually do with a GPS because your GPS would get a lock on the satellite and you would end up getting very accurate readings. And so you'd have a, a, an overconfident covariance matrix. So what you can do here is you can uh, just use like the manufacturer um, specifications. It, it specifies how accurate that is and you can plug that in uh, directly here. Now it should also be noted that uh, your your GPS readings will give you like a p-dot value so it'll tell you how how good the satellite fix is but you can't translate this directly into um, into uh, standard deviation in terms of meters. Um, you could do your own sort of heuristic to determine this but uh, for simplicity's sake, you might just want to set it to some uh, constant value. On the other hand, velocity readings are done using Doppler shift. And so your GPS will actually tell you in terms of meters what the, what the error is of your reading. So you can actually, uh, in your measurement, include velocity and you can redefine your covariance matrix to include that, that error. And then finally, moving on with our, our definitions here, Z is just going to be your actual measurement vector. And that uh, will just be your raw GPS reading. So you're going to get position and velocity directly from the GPS. So uh, go somewhere else on the internet, do some Googling. But if you take these variables, uh, we're going to define these in the rest of the example. And then the actual implementation of the Kalman filter from there should be relatively straightforward. So let's get another sheet of paper here. And then we'll continue through our example. So. I have acceleration and I have position, so now we want to be able to determine what position and velocity is at any point in time. And so the way that we can do this is we can just pull out some physics here. If you don't, if, you, if you've never seen this equation before, uh, maybe just do some more googling and sort of you know learn about this or whatever. But it, it's also like pretty intuitive, or sort of. So this is just a standard physics equation to determine position and velocity, or, or, or an, a, an equation that is true. So your final position is equal to your initial position plus your velocity over the, the delta time period and uh, uh, acceleration over your time period squared multiplied by one half. In the same way, you can compute velocity over time, and that's just going to be your initial velocity plus acceleration over a particular time period. Okay, now we can take these two equations and we can represent them as a system of equations. So I can represent this as P of V is equal to, I'm going to take, take this right here and I'm going to turn that into a matrix. 
And so that will become 1, delta t, 1, and 0. And if we multiply this by our previous state, absent no other inputs to the system, meaning absent any acceleration, this is going to be a true statement. So if I'm in space, I can estimate my uh, new position, my new velocity, by populating this matrix with my delta time period and multiply it by the previous state, and then I would get my, X, my updated position of velocity. Now if we want to action over here, that was basically assuming zero acceleration. Now if we assume input acceleration, turn this into a matrix as well, and we would get one half delta t squared, and we would get delta t multiplied by our input acceleration. Um, at this point I should point out for practicality's sake, I, I mentioned that we're merging GPS and accelerometer, um, but I didn't mention that what we want to do is split this out into three separate dimensions. So. I have, um, I have GPS readings that will give me latitude, longitude, and altitude. And then my accelerometer, uh, those need to be expressed in terms of absolute north, east, and down, or at least along those axes. And so this, the, your accelerometer reading off the shelf, that in itself is going to be an entirely, like entirely different problem. I actually have another tutorial video that explains how to take uh, AX, your, your acceleration vector, these are three values, I'll give AX, AY, AZ, uh, your GX, GY, these are your gyroscope readings, and then finally your magnetometer readings. So with these three, you will be able to get an acceleration in terms of north, east, and down. And again, that's an entirely separate topic, uh, that's an entirely different problem as well. Uh, and you can look at another tutorial video to understand how to do that if you don't already know how. So, the point is, if I have three dimensions, then I could represent all of this as a single Kalman filter, but it would get pretty complicated, or, or it's not necessary. So a simple and straightforward way of doing this is to have a separate Kalman filter for every single dimension. Um, so going back to here, when I'm doing all of these, these computations here, this is assuming a single dimension. So this is either going to be, um, I mean, yeah, you get the idea. This is going to be one of three dimensions, and I should mention that before going any further. So I've turned this into a system of equations with matrices, and then if we go back to our uh, Coleman filter definitions, we had these variables that we need to account for, and so we've already done that. So this PV is your state, this right here is your state transition matrix, so that's A, um, previous state. This matrix here is going to be B, this is going to be U, and let me just, I'll go and write these out. These are the, the variables that I wrote on the other sheet of paper. Define these and we're good to go. So we've got, we've got A, we've got B, we've got U, uh, Q and R are both the same thing. They're both going to be covariance matrices. I explained earlier how you can how you can come up with those. So those are good, those are good. And then Z is going to just be your actual PV measurements from the GPS, okay? So now we have all of those. And so now, uh, all you need to do is take these matrices, uh, compute the delta time period, uh, and then define those define those in terms of a matrix, do the matrix multiplication to compute this at every step, um, and that's really it. And the, the rest of the, for everything there is reasonably straightforward. I uh, hope this helps, and thank you for watching.